Dear colleagues, thank you very much for your interest in this topic. I'm excited to talk about non-invasive ventilation in the out-of-hospital emergency setting in the next few minutes. First, let's start with the disclosure. I do not have any personal financial interest related to this lecture. Before we actually get started, I think we should talk about the definitions. We should make, we should make sure that we are talking about the same and make sure that everyone is aware of their accurate definitions. I think everyone should be aware that respiratory failure actually occurs when a disease of the heart or lungs, or maybe also a combination of both, actually leads to a failure in maintenance of adequate blood oxygen level, the so-called hypoxia, or in the maintenance or an increase of blood carbon dioxide levels, the so-called hypercapnia. By definition, a hypoxemic respiratory failure is characterized by an arterial oxygen tension below 60 millimeters of mercury, with usually normal or maybe a low arterial carbon dioxide tension. In contrast, hypercapnic respiratory failure is defined as an arterial carbon dioxide tension above 45 millimeters of mercury and an arterial oxygen tension below 60 millimeters of mercury. Respiratory failure can actually occur acute. Acute actually means that it usually occurs within a couple of minutes or maybe only a few hours. In patients, usually with non or minor evidence of pre existing respiratory disease. Respiratory failure can also be acute and chronic. That means an acute deterioration of an individual patient with any pre-existing respiratory failure. This can be quite fast, but usually takes a couple of hours. Last but not least, respiratory failure can also occur chronically. That means respiratory failure develops over several days or longer in patients with definitely known existing respiratory disease. Acute respiratory failure is quite common, and we are all aware that this is a medical potentially life-threatening emergency. The population at highest risk, especially right now, really important is that these are patients older than 65 years with a known respiratory or cardiac disease. Please be aware that I'm not talking about COVID. COVID is completely different, and COVID might actually deteriorate on what I'm actually saying over the next few minutes. What are the four most common components of acute respiratory failure? First of all, infection, pneumonia, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, but also acute lower respiratory infection, and last but not least, acute heart failure. All of these four components actually have in common, that is a quite heterogeneous group, so the epidemiology data are quite sparse, and it's quite difficult to actually to define all these groups. That's a really serious problem. Acute respiratory failure actually accounts for 1.2 million hospitalization per year in the United States of America. That's a huge number. The impact on the healthcare system is huge. Please be also be aware that the 30 day mortality is about 10%. Having this said, one out of 10 patients admitted to the hospital for acute respiratory failure will actually die within the first month to follow. The definite treatment of acute respiratory failure mostly depends on the underlying cause, but patients often require the treatment in the ambulance during the transport to the hospital. At this point, it is difficult to accurately determine the underlying cause. So out of hospital treatment of acute respiratory failure often follows a common pathway rather than being just specific to the underlying cause. I think it's also important to understand that about 10% of patients admitted to the emergency room by an ambulance service, although oxygen is applied to these patients, have signs of hypoxia. 10%, although we are actually giving oxygen to these patients. 
Non-invasive uh, ventilation involves the providing respiratory support through a tight-fitting mask, which is usually applied around the patient's mouth and nose. I just show you a few pictures of the most commonly used devices. I do not have any stocks of any company. I do not uh, speak in... I do not want to advertise any device or any technique. I just want to show you some commonly used devices. So on the left side, you see a face mask. And I would say about 75% of all uh, emergency settings, this is the device actually used. In the middle, you see uh, a nose mask that works. That usually works, for example, SEPA for patients with OSA, that works but not really commonly used in emergency settings. On the right side, there is also a Discastor helmet. There are several different helmets available. This is just one actually used. Not shown over here is the pillow, which is especially commonly used in pediatric patients. There are two important possibilities of providing non-invasive ventilation. The first, the administration of CPAP involves the application of constant positive airway pressure during inspiration and expiration, usually using a pressure compressor or a flow generator. Important, this mode is suitable for patients who are breathing spontaneously because it can only provide a support to an underlying respiratory drive. CPAP improves the ventilation perfusion matching and thereby improves oxygenation. Another physiological effect of this mode of non-invasive ventilation actually is the reduction in venous return and a decrease in left ventricular wall stress, both of them being effective in an improvement in cardiac output. This is especially particularly important in patients with acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. At this point, there is no recommended initial pressure setting for CPAP and should just follow the clinical signs of the patients. The second, BIPAP. Bi-level inspiratory positive air pressure or non-invasive pressure support ventilation involves the application of preset inspiratory and expiratory pressures, which may be time triggered by preset controls, or it can be flow triggered by a patient's airway pressure. The recommended initial inspiratory positive air pressure should be about 10 centimeters of water, while the expiratory pressure should be about 5 centimeters of water. You can increase the inspiratory pressure uh, on a regular basis every 3 to 5 minutes by 1, 2, or 3, or maybe 5, but this is the initial setting which I should definitely suggest. Please be also be aware that the pressure support level at about 20 centimeters of water is eventually maintained during the BiPAP application, but this really depends on your patient. Non-invasive ventilation in the in-hospital setting is, I think there is no doubt about it. If you look on our ICUs, it is definitely a widely accepted alternative to invasive ventilation. And I think we all are aware that the non-invasive ventilation is usually used in three really important indications. First, acute exacerbation of COPD. Based on this analysis of this meta-analysis, it really reduces mortality, but also the need for intubation. There are several national clinical practice guidelines. For example, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, the NICE guidelines from the United Kingdom, actually recommend NIF as a treatment of choice for persistent hypercapnic ventilatory failure during an acute exacerbation. But please be aware that it should only be used for those patients who are not actually responding to standard medical therapy, and I'm talking about controlled oxygen therapy, but also nebulizers and corticosteroids. The second indication might be acute cardiogenic uh, pulmonary edema. There were a lot of publications clearly indicating that NIF in cardiogenic pulmonary edema reduces mortality and the need for intubation. 
I think important to understand there is a recent large RCTs in the in-hospital setting actually assessing mortality and the need for intubation and they did not find any improvement. Nevertheless, at this point, for example, the European Society of Cardiology still recommends NIF or should be considered in patients having shortness of breath and an elevated respiratory rate above 20 breaths per minute to ultimately improve uh, oxygenation by reducing hypercapnia and reducing acidosis. Last but not least, NIF can also be used in pneumonia. And again, there are some really nice studies, some reports that it actually is associated with a reduction of mortality and need for intubation. Please be aware that there are several national uh, guidelines or societies who actually advise caution using NIF in this patient. And some of them, for example, the British Thoracic Society actually advises if you use NIF, you should only do that on the ICU. I think all of them in common is that it's really, really important to initiate that as early as possible. Therefore, NIF in the out-of-hospital setting is attractive, as it would allow the treatment to be initiated much, much earlier. However, the out-of-hospital setting differs from the in-hospital setting in a number of ways. For example, diagnostic tools are missing. Most of us in the out-of-hospital emergency setting, we don't know the real cause for that, because we don't have the diagnostic tools. Second, the backup is actually missing. We do not have enough equipment, and if there is a failure, we do not have anyone else helping us out. And please be aware that during a transport, and especially in flight, in the helicopter emergency medical service, deterioration of respiratory function of patients is quite common. So there is some evidence in the in-hospital setting. So now let's talk about the out-of-hospital setting. And I just want to share this more or less recent analysis by Bandura and colleagues, which really conducted a really nice meta-analysis and summarizing the current evidence. First of all, there are only 10 minor randomized control trials in the field overall. And on top of it, on overall, they only include 900 uh, patients. That's not a lot. So having this said, this meta-analysis is the strongest we actually have in the field, but overall, the number of patients is by far too low and the evidence is a kind of weak to moderate. Nevertheless, so Pander et al. actually described that use of CPAP for acute respiratory failure is clearly associated with a reduction of mortality, but also a reduction of the intubation rate. CPAP. The BiPAP, in contrast, is completely uncertain. Based on this analysis, it does not reduce, but also does not increase mortality, and it tends to reduce the rate of intubation. But having this said, at this point, at least from a research perspective, it's really unclear. Just to have it said, CPAP is also more cost effective. What are the limitations of out-of-hospital non-invasive ventilation? First of all, as an advantage, it allows coughing and communication with the patient, which is really important. Communication with the patient, I think, is one of the most important things that we can actually do on ICU, but also in the out-of-hospital emergency setting. We don't need any sedation or muscular paralytics. It supports the self-feeding, which is not really important in the out-of-hospital setting, but it's also less difficult to wean. Major disadvantages and complications include pulmonary aspiration, gastric distension, vomiting, pressure lesions, not really in the out-of-hospital setting, but also device leakage, intolerance by patients, and last but not least, ventilator asynchrony. Important, the failure, rate, the failure rate is quite high, and there are a lot of reports, and they have in common that the failure rate is up to 40%. There are many technical limitations for a non-invasive ventilation in an out-of-hospital emergency setting. First of all, the size. It needs to be as small as possible. They have to be portable. They have to be robust. They have to be able to work with oxygen instead of compressed air, because we just don't have that available on a regular basis. Last but not least, we also 
uh, need to have a reliable power supply. There are many reliable devices currently available. So there are many devices actually able to be used for CPAP. In contrast for BIPA, there are only a few reliable devices currently available, but I would strongly suggest BIPAP is not or should not be used in the out of hospital setting at this point because the devices are not really reliable on one thing on one side and on the other side i just showed you the data the pipe up in the out of hospital setting is not really clear which really uh, approves patient outcome i shared these guidelines from the emergency medical service here at Cle here in cleveland and how does this actually work in the real emergency setting First of all, you have to be strict. You have to have a guidelines. You have to tell people how they should actually use that. So make sure what you want them to do. First of all, I want the, our paramedics to assess the patient according to our guidelines. Airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. Once this is done, please think about patient positioning. Sitting patients up usually helps a lot if you have shortness of breath. Assisted ventilation if needed, apply supplemental oxygen, treat if possible the underlying disease by giving nebulizers, but also intramuscular epinephrine and also intravenous steroids. And last but not least, before we go to endotracheal intubation, provide MIF. And if you use non invasive ventilation, I strongly suggest, or especially over here at the Cleveland area, only use CPAP at this point. So I already come to an end. I only had a, a few minutes. So what are my take home messages? First of all, the success rate of non-invasive ventilation really depends on the experience. The more experienced you are, the more experience the actual provider has, the more successful the NIF will actually be. The evidence at this point is extremely weak and really large RCTs are needed to really answer this question. I just showed you the meta-analysis which was performed a couple of years ago. Only 10 RCTs in the field, including between 20 and 110 patients, an overall of 900 patients. That's definitely not enough to answer this question. I strongly believe that non-invasive ventilation is great as long as it works. And this might be a really important take home message and you can manage the complication. The failure rate is 40%. So whenever you do the NIF, be ready to change your approach. Thank you very much for your interest and I'm ready to take some questions. Thank you.